everyone. How are you this morning? It's good to see you. Everyone's welcome at Gateway. If you're tuning in online, we want to say good morning to you as well. We're glad you're here with us. Do you want to jump to your feet? If you're able and willing, we'd love, as you, we'd love you to stand with us. You know, in the Word, it says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. So let's do that. Let's lift up Jesus in praise. Glorify Him. Give Him all the glory that He that He's due. We've got a good God, so we're going to sing this morning.
it's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow, for tomorrow's in your hands. All I need you will provide, just like you always have. Thank you, Lord.
we come across in our lives that you have not already won. God, yesterday, today and tomorrow, Lord, you have already won the battles. God, you have already defeated the grave. And we bring glory and honour to you this morning, Lord, as we lift your name together as your people. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here today and to praise your name. And your name is just so worthy of our praise, Lord. Your name that is higher than all other names. Your name that is above every other temptation or circumstance in our lives and in our hearts, Lord. Your name is above every other name. God, you are the lion and the lamb. You are our father and our healer and our provider. God, there are so many names we have for you, God, and we just praise you for who you are today. And we give all glory and honour and praise to your name. Amen.
Romans 8 begins with the words, there is no longer condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And as we were worshipping this morning, I had this picture in my mind of an old run-down house with the words condemned written on the front because the owners feel like there is no more any value in that. But I just, as I saw that picture, I saw a new owner of the house, Jesus, come through, rips off that condemned sign and He buys it. And He comes in not to just live in this old rundown house, but to restore it to its value that is better than it was in the first place. And I wonder this morning if you're here, you feel that maybe your life feels a bit run down or you feel condemned by the weight of the sin you have. I wanna tell you this morning, Jesus is not in the business of condemnation. He's in the business of restoration. And I wonder this morning if you wanna pray with me for the master carpenter whose earthly job was carpentry, but whose heavenly job is salvation and restoration, that He might come and restore your life today. Let's pray. Jesus, our Master, our Saviour, but also the one who comes to serve. We come before You this morning thankful that You wanna restore our life and not just any old life. You wanna restore us to better than before. That the condition of our heart would not be condemned, but be remade and refashioned in the light of who you are at your gentle, careful hand. So Jesus, today we put our life into your hands, Master Carpenter. Reshape our life, renew us and restore us that we might come to know you as our Saviour and not know condemnation, but freedom that comes with Jesus. We pray this, believing it's something you want us to pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Why don't you grab a seat right where you are today? If we haven't yet had the chance to meet, my name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at our Mackenzie campus. And whether you're joining us online or in campus today, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Gateway because everyone who comes to Gateway is very, very welcome here. Uh, we don't just want to help you feel connected, uh, feel welcome though. We want to help, do want to help you feel connected and get to know us as a church family. And there's a few things that you can do. If you are brand spanking new, you've been here for a little while, we'd love to give you a gift to help you feel welcomed here today. But you can also scan the QR codes you'll see in front of you, either on the screen or in the pew. Uh, you can fill out some information there. We would love to help you uh, find your place in a life group. Maybe you want to find a place to serve or maybe even serve at our KTO Kids Takeover event in June, July school holidays. There's anything you need, we can get in touch with you on that QR code. We'd love to be in touch and help you belong to part of the family here at Gateway Baptist. Uh, but today, you might have seen us, if you're on campus, uh, setting up as people had come through. Uh, all of the flavours of Beyond stalls out there with plenty of great food. There's some good food coming up. But each month, we get the chance to hear some stories about what God is doing through our Gateway Beyond workers, both locally and globally. And today, we'd love to show you Tian's story. Check this out. met Jada during orientation week as she came up to our club stall. As she wrote down her information to go into our prize drawer, she indicated that she didn't want to follow up with us and explore faith in Jesus, then walked away. Each step that she took away made her feel sicker and sicker in the stomach, and she had no idea why. But she knew in her core she had to come back and change her answer to yes. We followed up with her, and in May of 2022, she said yes to Jesus. In the coming months, she faced intense backlash and ridicule from her friends. And by November, she had made a decision to walk away from God as she had counted the cost and it didn't feel worth it. Jada went through some of the hardest months of her life, yet God hadn't given up on her. She started a new job as a disability support worker and she soon discovered that part of her job would be going to church. She once again felt sick in the pit of her stomach and knew that there was something more going on. This led to Jada spending hours every day after work, crying out to God in prayer. She saw God clearly answering her prayers and decided to come home to Him. She then felt called to step out in faith on a local mission to the Gold Coast for schoolies this past year. 
Jada had only been transformed by Jesus months earlier, yet she wanted others to experience God also. In her own words, she said, you just can't imagine how quick people are to open themselves up and change their mind about God. Jada is 100% sure that God is real and alive and no longer lives for the opinions of others now, only for God. She has a heart for missions and she is just one of many students on campus who have come to know him, been equipped to share the good news and have been sent out to reach the world. And I ask you to pray that God would send more and more students to join us this year so that even more students may encounter Jesus today, impact Australia tomorrow and reach the nations for eternity. God is powerfully at work in many of our Gateway Beyond workers. Yeah, definitely give a round of applause. Uh, Tian is working at universities and God is up to something incredible both in schools and universities at the moment with young people coming to faith left, right and centre and finding uh, faith and getting baptised. So I want to encourage you to keep supporting the work of Tian and our other Gateway Beyond workers by getting some delicious food at our Gateway Beyond. Uh, Flavours are beyond stall today. There are, there are bao buns and Japanese curry for lunch today. It's going to be great. Make sure you check that out as well as the cupcakes. Uh, every dollar we raise there helps go to work at the work of people like Tian as part of our Gateway Beyond worker family. Uh, but if you are, have your, if you, actually, if you've got kids in youth, uh, kid zone or kidlings this morning, why don't you grab a, something from the stall, get something to eat and head down to the amphitheatre straight after the service. Uh, we've got a, a, a family picnic happening on the amphitheatre on the, on the grass out there. I want to encourage you to get down there, meet some new people, maybe some people who are in the same age group as your kids, uh, get to know some other families today. We'd love to help you connect as part of that. So I want to encourage you, get some food, head down there, have a lot of fun. It'll be fantastic. Hey, we also had this week a really fun event here, which I actually didn't get to go to because I'm a man. We had our ladies' night, arty party night. Uh, had about 70 ladies here uh, doing some, oh, some love in the house for it. It's great. You might be able to see yourself on the screen uh, as, and painting some beautiful flowers. Uh, beautiful night. Lots of fun. I heard it was a great time, but I missed out. But I want to say, blokes, you don't miss out because in a few weeks' time, we've got our men's night coming up as well. There's something for men and women right across Gateway's family. So I want to encourage you, scan that QR code. Blokes, if you want to get to the men's night, make sure you register for it so we can cater for you. Make sure we've got plenty of food there as well. We'd love to help you connect in part of the life of the church family here. It's, um, check out all the details. First of June, scan the QR code. Everything you need will be there. One other really important thing that happened this week was we had our annual general meeting. And on Wednesday night, we gathered here in this place to affirm a few things. Uh, the election of a few new elders for us, uh, Josh and Reese. Uh, wanna, can, can we just get, if you're in the house, Josh, I can see you. Is Reese here as well? Just to stand to your feet for a second. Can we congratulate these guys for becoming a part of our leaders? Thanks, guys. And leading us into the future as well. One of the other, you guys can grab a seat. One of the other decisions we made as well as to affirm as a church family was to affirm that Lauren Luke has become a co-campus pastor with Tim as well. Laurie and Tim, can I get you guys to stand for a second as well? You guys know their faces, know them well. I was so encouraged that it was so affirming and so overwhelmingly affirming of our church family to support Lauren stepping up into the level of co-campus pastor with Tim. Uh, I've been blessed by Lauren's leadership and I know so many across our church family, particularly the 5 p.m. service, have as well. And Laurie, I can't wait to see how you'll lead us as part of our campus family here too. So we're gonna pray for uh, Reese and Josh and the both Lucas. So actually, boys, stand up again. I apologize to make you sit down and stand up. If you need these guys, why don't you run, run over and grab, uh, put a hand on their shoulder and pray for them. But we will have a proper commissioning in a few weeks' time for Lauren and Tim as they step into this role together. But if you know them, stretch out a hand, maybe get up around them, um, put a hand on their shoulder and pray for them as we pray for them now. Uh, also, as we pray for our giving to can see God continue to work here in the wider work of our church. You ready to pray? Let's pray. God, we wanna thank you so much that you are so powerfully at work in so many ways across our church family. Uh, but for Reese and for Josh, and for Laurie and Tim, as they take on these leadership roles as our church family, we wanna pray for strength and peace and wisdom as they do that. For each role that they have, we wanna pray that you bring them quite, so much clarity and so much vision for what you want us to look like as a church. God, give them every spiritual gift they need to succeed in their leadership. But we also pray for us as a church family, that as they lead us and shape us and guide us, together in partnership under your headship, Lord Jesus, may we know where you're calling us to go together, what you can call us to do together as your people on mission together. So Jesus, today we pray for them and we pray for the giving that we're about to give as well, that it might be used for your glory here among us, but beyond the walls of our church and beyond to see your kingdom come and you will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God, we thank you, we love you, and we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. 
Amen. Can we give these guys a massive round of applause? Well, that's probably enough from me this morning. YC, it's your turn to head out up to YC this morning as well, Youth Church. But if you are sitting in the pews this morning, why don't you scan that QR code, look at the menu for Flavors of Beyond and let us know what you're excited about by chatting to the person next to you. Hello there, Gateway Online. So wonderful to have you all with us. And there's the chat is buzzing this morning, it? and it's so good. Right. Yeah, everyone's jumping in, saying hi. And Janine and Andrea are there hosting. So if you haven't already, why don't you open that chat up, say hi, see what's going on in there, connect with other people today. Awesome. I heard there was a lot of Andreas on previously as well. Oh, so Andrea's the name for I today. I think you're Andrea today. Jump in the chat. We'd love to see how many Andreas are actually on Gateway Online today. That's kind of fun. So good. That's a weird, <laughs> a weird thing we're counting, but go for gold. <laughs> hey, awesome to have you with us. We, we've got Flavors of Beyond. I'm waiting for the chat to sort of come up with the, oh, it's so sad we don't get Flavors of Beyond. And we need like smell vision or something. That would be amazing. smell it wafting through the auditorium That would here. be amazing. Um, so good. But you guys can still be a part of community and we'd love to invite you to do that. You can join our Facebook, on uh, Gateway Online Facebook group. And there's just stuff that happens in there throughout the week, just connecting one another. We truly believe that you can find community in this online world. So I want to encourage you to invest yourself into that and be a part of it. Oh, I always love seeing what Mark posts during the week about getting people to chat about in the in the chat as well. So yeah. I get to know you guys a bit through that too because I'm part of that group as well. Yep, so. as am I. I yeah, love to fun. see what's going on in there and who's joining into that space. It's really cool. Yeah. Another way you can get connected is by joining a life group. Again, we have lots of those that happen uh, online from our Gateway Online community and just a great way to encourage one another in faith, in life, in just following Jesus and get to yeah. do it together. I know the life group I'm a part of and the one that I've been running for a number of years was just such a great place of connection and was so valuable to me. So I want to yep. encourage you. Yeah, jump on, jump on. Let us know if you'd like to be a part of a life group. We'd sure there's a place for you. Absolutely. So good. And um, yeah, want to just thank you for being with us today, whether you're new or you've been around for a little while. Love that you're here. Hope you're, um, yeah, really believe you're going to enjoy the message today. Tim is continuing on in our Roman series. He's preaching from Romans 8. Yeah, I reckon it's the best chapter in the Bible, personally. So. It's a bit cool, Brad, but why don't you jump in the chat and tell us what your best chapter, your best verse, your favourite verse might be. Uh, but yeah, we're sitting in Romans 8 today. It's going to be a good one. So why don't you give Tim a big welcome to the stage. Catch up. See you guys. All right. Can I continue? Encourage, I should say, to continue those conversations after the service uh, let me extend my welcome to you as well. It's great to have you here in the room or online today as we continue our Roman series. And thank you as well for your prayers for Lauren and I. It's a, uh, it's a new season for us as a, as a family and, uh, and we're really excited about what that's going to bring uh, about for our church as well. And uh, I'm sure we'll find out together uh, over the coming weeks, months and indeed years. Now, you might be thinking, oh, hang on, that arty party that Brad was talking about, are we all involved in that uh, this morning? Not quite. I'm going to explain what these are up for here for in a minute. But I love that uh, as a church and as a, a body of people, God gives us a whole bunch of different passions, abilities, and gifts. Some people love doing art. Unfortunately, that's not me. I actually failed art. At, uh, at school, uh, but I do love getting out in nature and seeing God's creativity on display. Who, who loves hiking here? Anybody love hiking, going on a hike or a walk up a mountain? These are, uh, these are my uh, hiking boots, and uh, I, uh, I love going on hikes, and kind of lacing these boots up and, and jumping on a trail and going on a journey, I love walking up to, uh, to mountains, to, 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 to lookouts, to, to go and see the, the, the broad expanse of God's amazing creation. And I have a mate this week who is beginning the Overland track down in Tassie. It reminded me of, uh, of when, as I was talking with him, reminded me of when I went on that track uh, and on that hike uh, down in Tassie a few years ago. You know, it's an it's a interesting journey. You start on the flats. I'm not sure there's a picture there. You start on the flats. It's actually a boardwalk. It's a really simple walk for a period of time. It's step after step. You keep going. 
And then the terrain gets a little trickier. You start walking through some thickets of trees. You start walking over the rocky ground. You start walking around the waterfalls and past the lakes. But as you keep walking and walking, walking and walking, on that first day, you suddenly start to see a glimpse of the summit of Cradle Mountain in the distance. You can start to see it through the trees and it spurs you on. And then eventually you get, you start scrambling all the way up the top. And at the top of that peak, at the top of the summit, you can see for all around you, you can see the journey you've been on. You can see the journey you're going on. And so today we're going to go for a hike through the book of Romans. Because look, the book of Romans is, is actually quite like, it's got some similarities to hiking up a mountain. And over the last few weeks, we've been doing this journey through the book of Romans. We've been looking, starting out easy, starting out looking at the, the, the argument that Paul is beginning to build. Oh, we start sometimes, it feels like you're walking through some incredibly dense forests. Some sentences that are just jam-packed full of insight. Sometimes it feels like you're going around a little bit in circles, maybe even getting a little bit lost along the way. But step by step, you start to build a sense of this argument that Paul is building. And over the last few weeks, as we've been exploring this journey, we've been going on this hike. So to the, today, we actually approach the summit of the book. Chapter 8, I believe, is the pinnacle of this letter to the Romans. We've come through the dense trees and the rocky ground. But as we approach this chapter, it feels that, 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 that the, 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 we're starting to picture through the trees. We're starting to glimpse through the trees the peak coming into view. And as we continue to climb and look around, we start to make sense of all that we've seen over the last little while. We can understand how this mountain fits in to the surrounding biblical narrative. And as we approach the top, we can see that we've started all the way back in Genesis, and we can see the future lies in Revelation. So allow me to be a bit of your tour guide this morning as we continue this journey that Paul is taking us on in this letter. And we started this journey four weeks ago in chapter one, where Paul says that God's qualities have been visible in his creation. Since the creation of the world, God's qualities have been visible. Now the story that Paul bases this letter in is the creation story. That God created this incredible, beautiful world. He put his people on the planet. He wanted to co-work with these people, but sadly, sin entered the world. Humanity has fallen. We've fallen short of God's glory. And because of sin, things like immorality and, and foolish hearts and futile minds has separated us from God. No, the, the perfect world that God created has been polluted by sin. We've all fallen. And we, we, we notice how Paul kind of takes his readers on a journey. A few hundred years, a while later, I'm not really sure how long, but a while later, God calls Abraham. He calls Abraham to continue this journey. No, God's people, the people in Genesis have rebelled, they've walked away, and God's tried to start again through Noah, but he sees Abraham, and he calls Abraham. He says, Abraham, if you follow me, I will make you into a great nation. Through your family, through your descendants, I will bless the whole world. And Paul refers to this. Paul says that Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham, against all hope, put his hope, believed, and he became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. Creation, the fall. God still wanting to journey with his people, and so he calls Abraham, and Abraham follows 
But then God's people get themselves into a mess. They end up in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. But once again, God doesn't want to leave his people on their own. And so he reaches out and he promises them that he will deliver them. Because he wants to use his people to bring his hope out into the world. And so we read in the book of Exodus that, that, uh, that Moses leads the people out of slavery and Egypt and towards the promised land. On that journey, God leads the people and he gives them the law. He actually gives them his presence as well. He goes with them through the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Ultimately, he is with them in the temple of the tabernacle, which becomes the temple. And these laws are good. But as Paul writes, they simply highlight the sin. Paul says, for sin, seizing opportunity affected by the commandments, it deceived me. And through those commandments, put me to death. Paul's saying and Paul's recognizing that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That the wages of sin is death. This is the journey that Paul has been taking us through in the book of Romans. This is Paul's message. And as we keep ascending this mountain time and time again, we see this tension of God wanting to be present with his people, wanting to bring his kingdom to the world. But sin holds us at a distance. Our sin results in separation from God, and we cannot make ourselves right before him. But this letter to the Romans, and indeed the whole biblical account, it's not all doom and gloom. Just like the sun peering through the trees on our ascent up this mountain, there are glimpses of hope. When all of a sudden, we see God's answer to our predicament in stunning clarity. God sends his son into the world. And Paul says that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. On the cross, Christ died for our sins. He took on the sins of the world and he gave his life as a sacrifice. And because of this sacrifice, we are made right before God. Paul says that this righteousness, this being made right, is given. It's given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, to Jew and to Gentile. And so this is the journey that Paul has taken us on. Sin entered the world at the fall of humanity. But God has been working to redeem his people. He's called them. And despite their rebellion and their disobedience, which ultimately leads in death, Christ provides the ultimate sacrifice to set us free. And as we step on this hike through the tree line, onto that last journey towards the peak. We can see the summit ahead. Paul stops, he takes a break, and he expresses his gratitude at the end of chapter seven. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. He set us free through Jesus. And so Paul leads us towards the peak of the mountain, one of the most stunning chapters in the whole Bible, a chapter that is jam-packed with truth, a chapter that is full of vibrant theology. And so it's also well, holds some very well-known Bible verses. We're going to come to a couple of those a little bit later. This morning, I, I couldn't actually limit the reading of this chapter by just picking out a few verses. So we're actually going to read the first 30 verses of Romans chapter 8. And uh, Kate is going to come and read this from the New Living Translation. It's a little bit more readable than the NIV. And this is a long reading, so I'm not going to get you to jump to your feet, but I want to encourage you to welcome Kate as she comes to read Romans chapter 8. Thanks, Kate. 
So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life, give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal, reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will re reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, 
he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Thank you, Kate. Yes, well done. Uh, what an amazing piece of scripture. Hey, can you just imagine how that would have been delivered in the early church when Paul's uh, messenger stood up in front of the gathering. And, and the, the historian suggests there's only a few hundred people and, and shares that message. Wow, it's just mind-blowing. And there's so much in there. But we reach this pinnacle and Paul introduces something new into the story that hasn't been part of the journey so far. Paul begin, begins to unpack what it means to live in the Spirit. He says that, uh, that there is new life in the Spirit, that we no longer live according to our sinful nature, but instead the Spirit lives within us, that the Holy Spirit gives us life and gives us peace, that the Holy Spirit is the same power that raised Christ from the grave, that lives within us. We are empowered to live a new life. See, Paul writes that those who belong to God have the Holy Spirit living within them. He talks about uh, this, this passage, and I think it's actually incredibly poignant today. For those who are uh, our church calendar buffs, today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is seven weeks after Easter. It's the 50th day since we, we recall Christ's resurrection. And in the book of Acts, about 2,000-ish years ago, on that Pentecost Sunday straight after Resurrection Sunday, God poured out his Holy Spirit on his people. The, the book of Acts tells us that all the believers were gathered together in one place, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit descended on them. There was a rushing sound, like wind entered the room, and what seemed to be a fire kind of hovered over each of the people in that room, each of the believers who put their trust in Jesus. And then they began to speak in different tongues and languages as the Spirit enabled them. God breathed the breath of His Spirit into these Christ followers. He gave them new life, gave them fresh power, gave them courage and boldness to go and preach the gospel. He gave them new life, life that wasn't, uh, wasn't locked into following this sinful nature anymore, but instead was empowered with Christ's strength. See, this is a, an ongoing journey, and, and now we kind of take a bit of a journey back. You know, when the Spirit came, it says we no longer live according to the sinful nature that leads to death. See, when, Paul, when, uh, when God presenced himself in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle and then in the temple, he did so in a place called the Holy of Holies. It was the innermost court of the religious structure that centered the Jews' religiosity and their community. And only once every year could the highest priest enter the Holy of Holies. After they'd made atonement, they'd paid for the sin by sacrificing an innocent animal. The, the, the sins of all the people had been washed clean. Only then could the priest enter in to the Holy of Holies. But the Spirit gives us new life. The Spirit lives within us. No longer can we only approach God once a year. No longer are there barriers and hurdles to jump over to encounter Christ's, uh, the Spirit's presence. But now, because of Christ, God presences himself within the believer. His Holy Spirit lives within us. There's no more seeking him for direction just once a year. He is constantly speaking to us. He's constantly leading us. And we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are set free to live for Christ. And there's three things that then Paul goes on to unpack, three new identities that we have as a result of the life that we have in the Spirit. And the first of these that we're going to look at today is that we are children of God. 
Paul writes that for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. We are adopted as children. Now Paul's original audience would have been very familiar with this concept of adoption. It was common practice in the first century in Rome, and not just by regular uh, people, regular business owners, it's actually a practice very common in the highest echelons of power. See, Julius Caesar, 100 years before this letter was written, was the emperor over Rome. But he actually adopted a young man called Octavian. And Octavian became known as Augustus. And Augustus kind of followed in the footsteps of Julius Caesar, walked behind him, looked at what he did and and learnt from the Caesar. And so when Julius was actually celebrated like a god after his death, Augustus steps up to the emperor's plate and declares that he is the son of a god. And he begins to rule in his own father's footsteps. You can see how this analogy makes a lot of sense when Paul talks about Jesus being the son of God. So the next five emperors in Rome were similarly adopted. None of them were actually biologically father and son. In our, uh, in our kingdom, our, uh, our king receives his kingship from his mom, Queen Elizabeth, who received it from her dad and so on and so forth. But in this, uh, this Roman times, each emperor was adopted in. Each successive ruler was chosen, was adopted, and groomed for the job. And this practice didn't just happen amongst the emperors. It happened amongst many families. An adopted son would often be chosen and trained up by his adoptive father to live out his father's character and qualities, to continue the father's work and to perpetuate his legacy. And this is how Paul describes how Christians are adopted into Christ's family or into God's family to continue the Father's work. Christ's followers have been adopted as God's children. We are no longer slaves, but we are adopted as his sons and daughters. Paul says in in Romans uh, 8 verse 29, for God knew his people in advance. He chose them to become like his son." so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. We're called to be image bearers of God in our world, to demonstrate his character and his qualities, and we're to become like him, to live out his values. In our world today, uh, to illustrate this point, I want to bring up my son, Saxon, this morning. And uh, very quickly, you can tell that he is not Adopted. I mean, look at him. He looks like a mini me right now. He, uh, he's got the same bad eyesight as me, but he's got many of the same qualities and characters as me. He actually walks like me. He talks like me. He loves his sport like me. He, uh, he, he loves his numbers like me, and he's incredibly patient and compassionate and loving towards people, just like his mum. But he's a bit of a mini-me, aren't you? You might see Saxon even after church on a Sunday. He will actually wander around behind me. He'll just kind of be there. As you're talking to me, Saxon will be there, almost like a, 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 an attachment, you know. He is very much a mini-me. He looks like me. He talks like me. And his character is like mine. Why don't we give him a round of applause? Good on you, buddy. <laughs> But this is what God invites us into. God wants us to be his image bearers in the world, to share his love, to show his grace, to speak his peace and his joy into the situations in which we find ourselves. He wants us to show his compassion and his justice. And God adopts us as his sons and daughters so that we can be his ambassadors, we can be his representatives, we can reflect his nature 
amongst creation. And he is our Abba Father. And this is a word Abba that Jesus used as he cried out to the Father. It's an intimate and a familiar word for dad. God actually invites us close. He pours himself into us through the Spirit. He transforms us into his likeness so that we can carry his light and his love to all those that we encounter. And the reality of being God's children is that we are also co-heirs in his inheritance. Paul continues, he says, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Paul makes an extraordinary claim here that as children, we are co-heirs with Christ that we will receive the same inheritance that Jesus will receive. We will be one day risen again. We will one day rule alongside Christ in his kingdom. It doesn't just mean that we're gonna cash out the bank of mom and dad and secure ourselves some real estate in heaven. Paul is saying that as Christ's followers, as co heirs with Christ, we will help carry on the family business. And again, carrying on the family business is a a biblical theme. We see uh, see it in Scripture as Jesus carried on the business that his dad did. And it's, it's something that we see through the Old Testament as well, things being passed down, inheritances being passed down from one generation to the next. I just had Saxon up here in a minute ago, but my middle daughter, Zaylee, she made a comment around the dinner table the other week as we were talking about the upcoming AGM. We were explaining to our kids that the members were voting about mummy becoming a campus pastor and Zaylee, just age 10, pipes up and says, I wish our whole family could be campus pastors. <laughs> and maybe when you're older, Zay, I don't think the members would have gone for that. But, but this is what Paul is saying in essence here, that as children... As heirs, we will receive the inheritance of working in the family business. And what is that family business? Well, that family business involves suffering, but it also involves glory. Again, we see this story throughout the Old Testament. God's people rejected him. God's people abandoned him. God's people turned their back in rebellion on him. Imagine the pain of your children rejecting you like that. I know some of the people in this room, some people joining online today, you are living in that pain. Our hearts are out with your hearts. As you've experienced your kids turning their back on you, this suffering, this rejection, this abandonment, we see Jesus experience it as well. He was abandoned by his friends, He's rejected by his people. The suffering Messiah was tortured as he was led to the cross. Suffering is part of this family business. And yet there is an incredible future that awaits, an amazing glory that far outshines the suffering. As Paul talks about it, it, this picture of, of glory far outweighing the momentary suffering. And Paul's listeners would have had a picture of what this glory meant. For the Jews amongst his audience, they would have been uh, 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 thinking and considering and knowing this prophecy that one day all things will be restored as they were intended. God would be present again with his people. He would return to judge and rule over his creation, restoring it and establishing his kingdom reign through his people. 
This means that in the future, when Jesus returns to judge and reign over all creation, his people, Christ's followers, will join him in that. All creation will be restored, will be set free. And Paul says that creation cries out for that. Creation longs for that. See, sin hasn't just affected humanity. When sin entered the world, it affected all of creation. There is death and decay. There is pain and there is torment. But one day, Paul looks forward to this day when all will be set right. Creation will join with God's children in freedom. And we see hints and prophecies of this through the Bible. The prophet Isaiah looked forward to a day in in Isaiah 11 that one day the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The cow will feed with the bear and the infant will play near the cobra's den and neither will be harmed nor destroyed. Revelation 21 and 22 also look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, a time when there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more tears and no more pain. All of creation looks forward to that day. All of creation cries out in anticipation of that freedom. It looks forward to being renewed and restored. And the beautiful thing is that God calls us to renew creation. I was gonna do this for the big reveal, but I stuffed that right up at the start, didn't I? I was meant to start with creation full and go to creation renew. You probably thought, what on earth are you on about, Tim? You've got no idea. God calls us to play a part in renewing his creation, setting it free. And the beautiful thing is we don't have to wait until the end of time. God actually calls us to play a role right now. He wants us to bring his kingdom to earth. Paul says that the Holy Spirit helps us, prays for us, intercedes with us, calls us and helps us to play our role. That's the, that's the summation of Romans chapter 8. That's Paul's been building up to this grand moment of saying we are all in this together. We all have a role to play in bringing God's kingdom here on earth. The letter to the Romans is full of great verses that are well known by uh, and, and used by Christians throughout the ages. Even if you've only been a Christian for a little while, or maybe you're actually still searching Christianity out. If that's you, it's so good to have you with us. But you might even have still heard some of these verses in Romans before. There are phrases and sentences that have been known and learned and lived out by Christians for years. You've heard some of them this morning. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, there's another one, which I reckon I want to just help us tweak a bit this morning. You, would have heard, you might have heard this verse before. It says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I want to suggest that uh, there's actually a bit of a tweak on our understanding that we need to pick up this morning. So you might have heard this verse quoted before. It says, God works for the good of those who love him. And it almost makes it sound like God, that we are God's boss, this verse. If you you don't read the context and understand the background, it almost sounds like that we get to tell God what to do. That if we love him and we follow him, that, that God will work out everything for our benefit. And in a sense, that's true in the ultimate story of creation. But sometimes I think we can get trapped up in in thinking that that is true in the day-to-day as well. And where it leads us to this, what I call car park theology, where we go to the shopping center on a busy morning, we drive into the car park and we start crying out to God. We start saying, Jesus, I love you. You are so good. And I want to be so good too. I, I, I want to follow you. But right now, will you help me find a good car park? <laughs> Who's prayed that prayer before? I've prayed that prayer before. Come on, let's be honest. I don't know if God answers those prayers. Maybe he does. 
But sometimes I think it means that we reduce God to this little genie on our shoulder, asking him to fulfill every wish that we ask of him. Oh God, I'm, I'm one of your good people. Can you work for my benefit to do these things? I've just never really sat comfortably with that concept. It makes me the focus rather than making God the focus. We can't just click our fingers to make everything right in the world just, or we expect God to make everything right in the world just for us in that moment. I actually think there's a slightly different perspective on this verse that makes a whole lot more sense in the story of Romans. See, the key Greek word at the core of this, of this, uh, of this scripture is the word synergio. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, and apologies to all the Greeks in the world. Synergio, that's where I'm going with it today. And it's where we get the English word synergy from. This Greek word means working together or to conspire actively for a result with one another. And Paul uses that word here to imply that not that God works for us, but rather that God works with us. You actually see this in your Bible. If you've got an NIV, you've been following along in Romans chapter 8 this morning, there's a little reference in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And if you read that reference down the below, it actually hints, it actually shows this translation. English bishop and theologian N.T. Wright suggests that here in Romans, Paul is mobilizing and encouraging the body of Jesus following, spirit-filled, adopted children of God to play their part in renewing creation. And he suggests that a more accurate translation, consistent with the whole argument of this chapter, which the NIV actually refers to, is this. He says, maybe we should be thinking about it in this way. We know, in fact, that God works all things together for good with those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. Having saved us from sin, having filled us with his Holy Spirit, God wants to partner with us to bring his kingdom on earth. God is collaborating with his people. God is collaborating with his church to see his goodness come about in the world. And this is consistent with God's intent all through the scripture. In the Garden of Eden, God worked alongside Adam and Eve to bring his goodness in the world. He called Abraham and his descendants to be a blessing to the nations. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go out into the world to share the good news after his death and resurrection. And God fills us with his spirit so that we are his people, helping to bring renewal to his creation. As N.T. Wright says, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who grieves over the pain of the world and the failings of his own people, the God who in the end reveals himself in and as the crucified Messiah, the God who then sends the Spirit into the hearts of his people so that God himself may, in and through his people, stand at the heart of the pain of the world so that the world may be healed. What a beautiful picture. So here we are. This is the summit of Romans, the point that Paul has been building to over these past eight chapters. Through Christ, we are God's creation. We are God's children, filled with new life in the Spirit and called to partner with God in renewing his creation and bringing his kingdom to earth. Often when you reach the summit of a long climb, there's a moment of reflection. You take in the view and you marvel at the incredible aspect that you're looking out at. And Paul does exactly that in the back end of chapter eight and onwards as well. But that's another sermon. You're gonna have to come next week for that one. Because we don't live on that mountaintop. We live in the everyday routine, the rhythms of work and rest, of family and friends, the ups and downs of life. But I believe this morning that God wants to encourage us, to remind us, to challenge us of the invitation to partner with him. In our families, in our work, in our community, God is moving. We heard this morning from Tian, that amazing story of that young woman on campus. And that's happening so many different places 
in our young adults community, in our community in general, of people just feeling led by God to explore and to ask questions. There are people yearning after him. They just don't know how. They need someone to come alongside them and help them on that journey. And he invites us to play a role, to collaborate with him in his kingdom work. And that's gonna look different for each and every one of us. Maybe for you, it's at work, and it means speaking hope and encouragement into that colleague's life. Perhaps it's about offering comfort amidst others' trials, putting aside the work conversations for a moment and simply being a safe person to share with, someone who might offer to pray. Or maybe God will present an opportunity to you to share the good news with someone this week. Remember, he has filled you with his Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you to be open to his prompts. Take the opportunities that he offers, those open doors that he invites you to step through. Or maybe it's in your family. You know, God wants you to take renewal with you into your family. He might be calling you to sow peace where there is division, to love even when it hurts, to persist in grace. Maybe he's inviting you to notice the ones, to show compassion to those, to stop and give someone time when others would just walk past. I felt really prompted this week as I've been thinking and processing this whole chapter that God wants to commission us for the task of partnering with him for the sake of his kingdom. He wants us to say yes to him, to be open to his leading to follow his spirit's prompting. And so this morning, we're gonna sing an old chorus, a song written by Keith Green, a man whom God moved powerfully both in and through. And we're gonna sing it as a, a prayer of commissioning, a prayer that says, Lord, as your child, help me to seek you. Lord, would you use me? Lord, would you shine your light through me? Lord, would you do it all for your glory? So as the team leads us in this song this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to what God is inviting you into. God is knocking on the door of your life, saying, you are my child. Everything I have is yours. Will you work with me to bring my goodness into the world? As we sing this song this morning, if you want to say yes, to that invitation, I'm just gonna invite you to stand as we sing. Maybe there's a particular thing in your workplace, a task in your family, a responsibility in your community that God has put in your heart. Perhaps today it's just more of a general response saying, yes, God, here I am, take me, use me. But as a declaration, as a step of faith this morning, as we sing this song, if you wanna accept your role in collaborating with God for his kingdom's sake, I wanna invite you simply to stand and uh, allow me to pray with you. Thanks, team.
your glory. Jesus, we live to see your kingdom come. God, we thank you so much for your incredible love for your creation. That despite our sin, that you would call us your children. That we could be made right because of what Christ has done on the cross, the sacrifice that he has made for us. And Jesus, that you would give us new life in your spirit. God, I pray for each and every person who's standing today. Lord God, that we would know your presence within us. We would know your guiding power within us. Lord, that you would use us to bring your kingdom to this earth, to play our role in renewing your creation. Jesus, we thank you that you go before us. We thank you that you have set us free. And Jesus, we pray that you would help us to bring your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we do it all for your glory. Jesus, it's your glory that we seek. Lord, it's your kingdom that we wanna build. Jesus, we thank you that, you that your scripture promises that one day you'll return and establish your reign and rule over all things. Lord, we can't wait for that day that you will be, all of creation will cry out that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That all creation will be set free in your freedom. God, would you help us to usher in that day? And until that day happens, would you help us to live your light and your love in your world? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I want to encourage us all to stand as we conclude this morning. We're going to sing uh, a final chorus this morning, just declaring that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that His kingdom will be established and that His reign will be full. Come on, let's sing this morning that Jesus is the King of kings.
serve. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us here today. I want to encourage you, if you're looking for prayer this morning, we've got a team that would love to come down the front and pray for you. There's also a team online who would uh, love to pray for you. Just click the button and somebody would love to pray for you. I want to encourage you to hang around after the service, grab something from uh, Flavors of Beyond. If you're uh, here with, uh, with kids, take your kids out on the amphitheatre, connect with other families as well. There's plenty of space for everyone to connect around uh, the, uh, the property today. So please hang around, have a chat. And as you leave from here, be empowered in the Spirit to live that, uh, that life equipped in power and in peace and in love and in grace to go and renew creation. God bless you. Have a good one. We'll see you next Sunday.